All right, guys, welcome to another episode of Side Quest Podcast, the unofficial podcast of Fitocracy. If you are not checking us out on Twitter, you can check us out there at SideQuest FM. You can find us on Instagram as well at SideQuest FM. You can find us on Facebook at SideQuest Podcast. Like us there uh, and you know, hang out with us in that little bit of a community that we have. But today I have an awesome guest, uh, someone I have been looking forward to speaking with for a very, very, very long time. Uh, he is a co-founder of Fitocracy. Uh, he is the one and the only Dick Talons. Dick, welcome to the show. Thank you, sir. <laughs> how are you this evening? I'm not bad, but I have I do have one question. Yes. Okay. How come all of my boys and Stephanie have been invited onto your podcast before me? I've been wanting to come on for the longest time. Cause cause I was waiting until I became the official podcast. I don't know. I don't but <laughs> that's that's really what it was. I was waiting for like you and Brian to be like, you know what, we'd like to work. You can be the official podcast. And I was gonna be like, cool, let's make an episode. But fuck it, who cares? <laughs> oh well, mommy and daddy are fighting right now, so so that <laughs> might <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I I love Brian. He's we've been through very difficult times together. We we love each other. But mommy and daddy <laughs> kind of in a tussle right now so yeah this i mean this is you know as good as good as um it, as good as anything <laughs> well and, and you're and you're the fitness guy you know you 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 train clients and and you you have a lot more experience working one-on-one with people and you have a pretty interesting story uh going from you know the fat kid to being on a bodybuilding stage um which i find very interesting because i've thought about it myself um my wife, however, has been like, no. <laughs> I don't think she wants to deal with that crazy. But, uh, but yeah, so you're a busy guy, Dick. Like, you have tons of clients, and you are writing for multiple, multiple places nowadays. How do you keep yourself from getting distracted? How do you not sit down at the computer and get lost in cat gifs on Reddit? Honestly, Adderall. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm... Uh, I'm in- Incredibly, incredibly ADHD, right? I, uh, I was actually diagnosed in 2013. It was pretty life-changing. Um, I, don't, I don't think I've talked about this very much, like, openly. But, um, yeah, you know, I had always been an underachiever growing up, right? Uh, horrible grades in school. Um, you know, I would always test well. And I would always, like, a standardized test. But for some reason, I would not do well in, in basic classes where, you know, kids, um, well, you know, people who are not necessarily, there, there are lots of people smarter than me, but in high school, there were a lot of kids who were, you know, kind of like lower intelligence and they would just like kick my ass in other classes, but I would do well in certain classes, right? Um, and so the way that I function is if there is a topic that I really, really, really like, I can be glued onto a screen for like 12 to 24 hours. Right, and you're 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 a gamer, right? Yeah. Oh, of course. <laughs> so that is like the typical gamer mentality. Actually, I actually speculate that you know there's probably some selection bias there. Most gamers are probably most serious gamers are probably ADHD, right? So um, that sets the kind of makeup. So things like writing, things like coding, things like helping clients and, and getting into like really deep, stimulating, dopamine stirring conversations. <laughs> Are things that I can do and like not get distracted by, but everything else like tying my shoe or doing the dishes or you know people it, those things suck for everyone, but they they especially suck for me. Um, and so luckily I, I have um, a lot of people who I either work with or collaborate with that balance out like those shitty characteristics of mine. So it all works out. <laughs> well. I know if people know you, then they, they probably know your story a little bit. Um, but, you know, I'll let you tell a little bit. How did you get to, to how did you get to the bodybuilding stage? Just a little bit of, of, of who you are and where you came from. Because um, I want to build up to kind of how you one day went, man, screw this. I want to start a company. And that company ended up being photography. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so um, I was my heaviest in 2003, right? I was 220, 230 pounds. I wasn't fully, uh, what am I, I round up to 5'10". Uh, I wasn't fully 5'10 yet, um, so I was like 5'7", 230 pounds. Like really, really, really fat kid. Um, and then, you know, I, I tried losing weight many times before. 
And for some reason, one time it sticked. I just got enough momentum where I was so excited by seeing those results go down on the scale and getting another characteristic of people like us. Um, you know, we're, we're very like quantitative and metrics driven. Yeah. So when I saw like 5, 10, 20 pounds on the scale, I was like addicted to that progress. Uh, so 2003 to 2004, I went from 230 pounds to 160 pounds, not in a healthy way at all. Um, and like any geek, you know, at that point I looked like a sharp hair. Right? I was like, oh, when I, you know, <laughs> I didn't have abs. I looked like a fucking sh like sharp hair, like skin was just like hanging everywhere. Um, and I was like, how do I, how do I get abs? So I did whatever geek does and I went on Google. And the first thing I found was just like bodybuilding.com. And I'm not a bodybuilder, like, by nature, but I'm a geek, right? Like, yeah. you think of bodybuilders, and they're, like, they're jocks, right? Um, right. But I found those types of communities, and I found that there are a lot of geeks like me, so I just started following those communities. I, I became obsessed with, like, you know, what people would know today is bro science, like, eating six meals a day, uh, making sure that you eat your first post-workout meal within the anabolic window, and, um, you know, fast forward to 2000, when was my first contest? 2006. So, like, 2005, I gained probably like 30 pounds of muscle or so. And I was I was pretty chubby, but I was at the point where if I leaned out, I would probably have a six-pack. Because um, I had no muscle before that. And, uh, yeah, I just went really, really hard and um, decided I would do a bodybuilding contest. And, um, yeah, I uh, to, in November 2006, I did my first one. Um, I got down to like seven or eight percent body fat. Had abs for the first time, which is really weird if you're used to being fat all your life. Looking in the mirror, things like, <laughs> like obsessed over the mirror like a cat, just like watching its reflection. Um, and then unfortunately after that, what I didn't realize is that you can only push yourself so hard until you rebound the other way. Yeah. So I got down to 160 pounds, like I said, seven percent body fat, and um. Within two months, I was back up to 200. Not not the original fat 200, right? Right, right. Yeah, I was probably at like 20, 23% body fat or so. Which is a huge jump. I mean, that's that's yeah. that's humongous. Um, so I so I I have to ask: Is would it, would you ever tell anyone, you know what, do it once, get on a bodybuilding stage once, just to see what it's like, or is it is it as intense as that one documentary? Uh, on YouTube, I think it's called "I Want to Look Like That Guy." Um, well, I, I think I, I think I know the one you're referring to. Yeah. Um, is it is it that intense in the last couple of months? Like, is it something you have to really be prepared for? Or is it something that you would say, you know what, do it once and then never do it again? It, I guess it depends on your background, your history, your goals, and like how ADHD you are. So, so somebody like me, I would never have recommended a bodybuilding contest uh, because. What, you know, back then I was stubborn. I'm not stubborn anymore. Right? I, got, <laughs> I, I thought I was so fucking smart about, like, bodybuilding in the back then, and now I realize, like, I don't know shit right now. Like, no one really knows shit. But back then I was really stubborn. And so when somebody stubborn like that commits to a bodybuilding contest, what they do is they go as hard as possible, and they don't realize that they don't necessarily have control of – all of the decisions that they make, like uh, control is something that's a little bit of an, uh, an illusion to people. Um, and so when I got down to 160 pounds, I was starving, right? like absolutely starving because I pushed myself for months and months. Um, I, take, I think it took me like six months to actually get down to that weight. And so I just like binged and binged and binged and, and losing that sense of control and not realizing what was going on and, and um, not realizing that it wasn't necessarily my fault. It made me feel very, uh, you know, like I had no, no, po no power over, over anything. Right. Um, and so it was, it was a very psychologically damaging experience for somebody like me. Right. Um, it's helpful now as a coach, now that I've kind of, kind of digested that, that knowledge and I can help other people. Uh, but if you're not going to be a coach and, and you have a similar background to me, then it's probably not worth it to um, to do in the short run. Maybe that could be a goal like five, ten years down the line, um, but it probably will be more damaging than not. It depends on how far you've um, you've come from. I think um, my friend Dell, who was on your show, um, Ice Cream Gal, yeah, uh, you know, she wasn't as like 
obese as me and, and she's she probably has a lot more self control than I do. So for her, uh, it was a good experience, right? Uh, it did teach her a lot. So it really depends on on the person. I got you. I got you. Um, yeah, I've I've dabbled with the idea myself, and then after watching that YouTube documentary, I was like, uh. I don't know if that's something I want to do. I kind of like eating food. Like I don't like even now. Like I'm I'm in a cut right now, and I've told myself I'm not going <laughs> below two thousand calories. Like if I get to where my body is like that's it, we're not losing anymore. I'm not going below two thousand. I did it last year. It was awful. <laughs> yeah, yeah, going below two thousand sucks. Um, what's your what's your like body fat height weight right now? Right now? Uh, last time I measured, which is the weird thing. Like I measure and then I put it in like. Uh, like online, and it says I'm like 10%. I'm like, there's no way I'm 10%. Like, it just, I, there's no, it doesn't seem to make sense. Um, but like, probably right around 11%, like 171 pounds. Like, I'm, I'm fine. I just kind of want to experiment, do some self experimenting on like uh, reverse dieting. Um, yep. Since I've been reading a lot about that. Um, but, yeah, even in, even at my wedding last year, my wife was like, you look too skinny. Like, <laughs> my oh, suit really didn't fit when I got to the wedding day. It was, it was, <laughs> it was, I, I didn't fix it. yeah. Look, you're young, everyone should experiment, you know. <laughs> <laughs> true, true, true. You never know if you like it or not. <laughs> <laughs> So, so, so you do the bodybuilding and, and you, you're working in New York City and you're a programmer. So I want to, I got to ask, how did photography come about? Were, were you just like at a bar one night and it's like that drunken moment like where like two guys are like, dude, we should own a bar. But instead of a bar, you're like, dude, we should do a startup. You call it puzzles. No, so photography, <laughs> photography came about all the way back, I shit you not, in 2005 which is like five years before there was any sort of work in it. Um, the first kind of, in, not inception, the, the first um, time the idea of photography came about was when me and my good buddy from home, um, his name is Yin Chin, funny, funny Chinese dude. Um, he, he's known me since I was fat. He's known me since I've gone by Richard, right? And right. He, Dude, you were, we were at a buffet, actually. Um, we were at a Japanese or Chinese buffet, and I'm just, like, stuffing my face because I can eat, like, a fuck ton. And he's like, dude, Dick, you are the exact same person as when you were fat. Um, except instead of playing EverQuest, which is the game I played before, you know, the, the precursor for World of Warcraft. Right, right. Um, instead of playing EverQuest and having a character, he's like, you're kind of, like, just, like, leveling yourself up, but you're the exact same dude. Um, and I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, it is kind of like I'm like, I'm like a character in a video game. Um, and so fast forward six years, um, you know, Brian and I were in our first jobs out of college and we're thinking about a startup that we wanted to do. And, um, you know, this is one thing that I just like always been thinking about. Like, what if you could turn yourself into a, a character in a game? Because I'm fucking nerdy. Um, and it made a lot of sense because both of us were gamers. We knew that the, the space was pretty saturated. Um, and so we went with that, right? And it got a really good response. Um, I don't know if I would start something with that pitch right now, to be dead honest. Uh, but, you know, we got enough traction where everything just kind of kind of happened by accident. There are a lot of startups um, that are, you know, intentionally planned, and there's a lot of research behind them. Um, and that's part of the reason that they're super successful is because people think a lot about the space, but everything with photography really just happened by accident. There are pros and cons to, to something um, organically sprouting like that, but that's right. how the story works. So, so you were a gamer and you played EverQuest. Is that is that like your favorite game of all time? Was that what got you addicted, or was there one before that? Like, what what is your favorite game? My favorite game ever. Super random. Oh, and there's kind of a funny story behind this. Uh, it's, it was called Nexus, the Kingdom of Winds. Have you ever heard of it? Probably not. No one's ever heard of this game. Um, was it a PC game? It was a PC game. It only had like a 1,000 people in 1998. Um, it launched with Ultima Online like around the same time. So it was one of the first ones, but it never really got traction, but it had this like hardcore niche community. And uh, 
that's how I got hooked on video games. Turns out, have you ever heard of this dude, Roger Lawson? He's like this big, buff, black dude, uh, fitness pro, nicest guy in the world, really funny. I love the guy to death. Um, 2012, we both find out we played the same fucking game in 1998. And wow. We're like, yeah, so random. And I've never, ever, ever met somebody from that game again. Wow. I think I've heard of it. I have a friend who's a huge... Like, his level of geekdom is even over mine, because I didn't get a computer until, like, 1999. So in 1999, I was like, Wait. I have to play Star Wars TIE Fighter versus X-Wing because I never got to play this game as a kid. Um, so he knows all these crazy uh, PC games. But I think I've heard him talk about that before, and he said it was it was pretty awesome. Oh, yeah, no one... uh, you should double-check if it's Nexus, because he would have known who I am on, on Nexus. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, it's funny. I was the exact person on Nexus when I was like 12 years old. I was like this troll who was like, like really well known in the community. And like, I was, um, I spent all my fucking time trolling and then like eh, switching between trolling and being serious. And like, no one ever knew who the fuck I like. like <laughs> so, so you are, you are pretty well known for, for, for trolling and, and making some hilarious, uh, comments. What have you, have you ever like, gone in somewhere and being completely serious and people thought you were trolling and they're like, yeah, dick, okay, whatever. Oh, yeah, no, that happens all... So, trolling for me is an outlet. So if you look at all the people in the fitness industry who deal with a lot of clients and have to exhibit a lot of empathy, right? Um, you, know, you can name them. There's John Romanello, you know, let's say uh, Alan Aragon, Lyle McDonald, Martin Brickan, Eric Cressy, just to name a few. Um, if you analyze, they're, they're kind of personas, right? Um, you have the ones who are business minded and they're brilliant, but they also know how to make money. They know how to build a business and they're also good for the community because they had a lot of value. Um, but they also build businesses off of that businesses. Um, and so they never go crazy, right? If you look at the people who are more kind of geek science, not business space but super passionate you've got like Alan Aragon and it doesn't mean that they're less successful because um, sometimes they're more authentic and they have more followers more fans right. and you know they, they have a bigger following so um, yeah Alan Lyle Arden um, Matt Perryman the ones you don't troll end up going fucking crazy like if you think about every single one like Lyle McDonald Martin Burkan they don't troll they're super serious all the time, and they just like won't fucking bash it. So I do think there is something about trolling that is actually, actually a catharsis. And I have, I have this like large, I could write a thesis on this, but it, it has to do with the fact that when you, um, it, it's well known that when you have a sort of job that requires a lot of empathy for others, uh, say a social worker, right, um, or psychologist, you lack what's called self-care and it, you know essentially that that draws from the same pool of resources so I help a lot of people and I don't take care of myself for some reason trolling helps I don't know why I can't explain about trolling. <laughs> like it, it helps like like quell the shitheads out there that I have to deal with so that I can actually help the people who deserve to be helped right it makes sense yeah, no, I mean, makes t makes total sense. There's there's a lot, because there's a lot of shit out there, and sometimes you're just like, I'm sorry, I just gotta, I gotta poke, I just gotta, I just gotta poke a little bit to laugh. Um, so you you move from data, like you did data entry, um, and you know photography. Now you have clients. Is there anything else besides fitness that you've always dreamed of doing? Well, so to back up just a little bit, so so in college I studied businesses, right? Um, right. and I, I worked for Chase. I thought I was going to go into some sort of like finance technology thing. Um, I had some really, really weird gigs. I uh, actually started a startup, uh, cupcake bakery in Philadelphia, which was mildly successful. Um, I swear to God, I'm not kidding. Here's one of those times where you think I'm trolling. No, 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 no. It's, it's okay. When I, when I lived in New York city, I worked at crumbs. So oh, awesome. there you go. <laughs> um, yeah. And then I, I, um, started a consulting company where I uh, help people take physical nautical charts that were in vessels like the Gulf of, in the Gulf of Mexico 
And uh, the consulting company took those charts and turned them digital, which huh. is uh, frightening because I literally have software in like the Gulf of Mexico used by ships, and I have no sense of direction, so I don't know how those turned out. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> so Dick is to blame for an oil spill secretly. Thanks, Dick. <laughs> yeah, really. If you look into the deep water horizon, it's like. <laughs> God, I said water like a New York person. I said water. Um, <laughs> yeah, but I, I've just been like always – I've never really figured out what I want to do just because of this like horrible ADHD that I've had. Um, and so it was anywhere between like business – it was somewhere between business, technology, starting a company. Um, and I think that – what was the original question? <laughs> That's why I'm not. I just like I'm only. It was. Do you like? Was there something besides fitness? Something you've always wanted to do that, like, in the back of your mind is on the back burner that you're like, I'm gonna do this someday. Some. It, it could be the craziest thing in the world. You want to be, you know, the next, uh, you know, Martina Nilova. I don't know. Oh, um, I think I'd be really good on reality TV. Like, if I <laughs> following me, holy shit. That actually, I'm not gonna lie. That would that would like on Celebrity Apprentice, it would be awesome. <laughs> like no filter, um, trolly, funny, not taking myself seriously, and, and very willing to get embarrassed. I think I'd be the perfect reality TV show. I I I think you would be. <laughs> Instead of Big Brother, it's just a bunch. It's Fitness Brothers. It's just a bunch of fitness industry people. <laughs> what? Porn also. I have the name. I have the piece. Uh, <laughs> good at sex. So, you know, the only reason I'm not going to do that is because um, it really precludes a career in anything that's not porn or anything. Right, like right. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe not. I mean, you, you, you could go – you could be like the next – you're like private eye. You do it like Dick Talons. Like that sounds like a private eye already. Detective Dick? Maybe? Detective Dick. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, wait. Now we just went, went back to porn. Damn it. <laughs> no, I have, I have no attention to detail. Um, so I would be a horrible, horrible private eye. Um, I think I could have actually been a really good um, psychologist, psychiatrist. Um, I'm really good with talking to people, and I'm really good with drugs. <laughs> <laughs> Well, a lot of your a lot of so a lot of your writing is very psychology based. Like you're you're very good at figuring out the human basics, you know, and 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 the way that we think and the way we operate. Um, and your newest article that actually came out today um, was about like the harsh truths of of dieting. Um, so, which of these harsh truths was the toughest for you to face as as you moved from being the fat kid to Ooh, that's the a fat kid? That's a really good question. It was probably the um, – you you know less than you think you know about health and fitness. Um, and the reason I'm, I'm good at writing about these things and, and I think it's okay to brag about it is because I was horrible, 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 horrible um, as an actual person who has experienced them. So when I was fat, I, uh, I, you know, I was super stubborn, no self-compassion. I was terrified to death all the time of what people thought about me and, and that they thought I was lazy. Um, and so this this persona that I write about in the article, I call him Steve, right? Like that was exactly me, right? I would, yeah. I would um, pretend like I knew everything about health and fitness because if I didn't know everything about health and fitness, then it was my fault, right? Um and so when I write about these, these things that are, are psychologically based, it's funny because all the commenters are like, you're a fucking asshole. You're so pedantic. You're so fucking um, – but I'm writing about these things because these are things that I've had to struggle with or I've seen right. clients with. Uh, and it's just like – it's really – I don't want to say sad. I don't want to say frustrating. But human nature – like humans are just like very, very funny creatures. They read what they want to read. Um, if you look at the comments on that article, for example, they're just like really funny. I spent like probably a quarter of the article to the point where my editors are like, you should stop apologizing to everyone for what you're saying because like it does make sense. And I, I was still apologizing. I was like, you know, if you're fat, it's not necessarily your fault. Um, anyone in the same circumstances with the same set of genetics would have been, you know, they would have had the same sort of fitness level that you have. Um, 
And you look at the comments, it's like, Dick hates fat people. What a, like, what a fucking cunt. Um, whereas, like, they, they just saw the article, immediately, like, shielded their ego, um, and didn't read what somebody had to say, even though it, it literally could have changed their lives. That's how much human beings suffer, right? Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, we, we do. We tend to, we get so comfortable in, in what it is that we believe that as soon as someone, you know, says something to the contrary, we immediately kind of, you know, freak out and go, no, 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 no. The truth is what I know. It's, it can't be, it can't be this. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Which, go ahead. Oh, it's, it's just fascinating to me that like, and it's fascinating that I was, um, I was kind of vulnerable to this too. Like, there are some things where, yeah, I, I could see why um, you would tie that to your sense of self, right? Like religion, politics, I could see that, right? Like, yeah. Um, but something like fitness, right? Telling somebody that they're wrong about their belief in carbohydrates and like here's some studies showing the opposite. Um, it's just really funny, and I don't say this blaming anyone because, again, I was that person that, that the immediate instinctual reaction is to say, no, like carbohydrates are good or carbohydrates are bad, as opposed to looking at the data, digesting it, and then trying to formulate your own, you know, using some you know, like Bayesian logic, to formulating your own world or, or mental model yeah. on certain Yeah. No, that's, that's, I, I, I just I, I enjoy a lot of your stuff because that's just that's you're very straightforward and you can tell that you're talking about you. You're like guys, that I did this. This is me. Like I'm not just some asshole out here telling you that you're fat. Like I was a fat guy, but I had to realize that I have power over this. Uh, and I think that's I think that's a hard thing to like to kind of come to grips with that. I think so much of our society and so much of and I I sort of blame the '80s. Granted, I was born in the middle of it, and that's maybe wrong for me because I can't really blame the 80s. But the 80s kind of had that me, me, me attitude, and everyone put blame on other people instead of, like, yourself, you know, and taking responsibility. And I, I think it's one thing we shied away from uh, a lot in, in the last generation is, you know, uh, self-responsibility. And I think we're slowly starting to kind of come back to that. But yeah, yeah, things I like would, social media don't help with that. <laughs> I would, I would definitely say that that that's the case. And it's interesting, like, so I didn't grow up in the U.S. Um, I grew up uh, middle of the Pacific, Marshall Islands. Um, my family's all from like the Philippines, all from Asia, and like just the way that different cultures, I guess, express themselves or experience things is just very interesting. Uh, like Asian people love shaming, right? And somebody, there was a follower of mine on Facebook who posited, he's like, if everyone shamed people for being fat, and I would never, ever, ever shame somebody for being fat, but this actually made me, made me kind of think, like, if everyone shamed somebody for being fat, there'd be no fat people. And, and my, my gut reaction was like, no, because if you shame somebody for being fat, what they're going to do is they're going to feel worse about themselves and they're going to eat more. Right. Um, and then I thought about Asia, right? And obviously there's a different environment, but if there were enough critical mass, as horrible as it sounds, like maybe, maybe there's some credence to that hypothesis. I don't know if there isn't or not, but it's, you know, I, I would never tie myself to, um, to, to a certain theory. And, and I think that depending on your culture, depending on where you are, you know, Outcomes are, are obviously different and people react differently. Right. Is there a theory that like you used to hold on to that now you look back at and like you don't believe in anymore, but you laugh at yourself for ever believing? Absolutely, dude. Um, I thought carbs were the fucking devil because here's why it made, it made a lot of sense. Um, I didn't know the difference between weight loss and fat loss. All I knew is that when I dropped all carbs, I could eat as much protein as I wanted. Right. Within like three to five days, I would look super skinny. On the other hand, even if I introduced a little bit of carbohydrates, and, and this was early on in my dieting career, so my insulin sensitivity probably wasn't very good. 
Um, and I probably had a pretty low uh, caloric maintenance. And let's be honest, when you allow carbs, if, if you're an all or nothing person and you allow carbs or shun carbs, that could be the difference between like three to 400 grams a day versus like zero grams, like zero yeah. to 30 grams a day. Um, so I noticed that like I could eat as much as I wanted without carbohydrates and lose weight. And so instantly I'm like, Jesus, the entire world has it wrong when it comes to my body. It must be insulin that's making people fat. Um, and, you know, that that was uh, exacerbated by the fact that I'd read things about, like, you know, Gary Tobbs and about Keto, Atkins. It was Atkins way back in the day when I thought this. Um, and that made a lot of sense, and I would use confirmation bias to um, kind of cherry-pick this data. And when somebody presented the opposite, uh, obviously I would just, like, you know, shun it. Right. Shun that evidence. Um, and then I started reading things by uh, there's this, this woman named Evelyn Kokur. Um, she has a site called Carb Sane Asylum. Um, and she posed some very, very interesting rebuttals to the anti carb movement. Um, and they made a lot of sense. And what I liked about her is she was very, very objective. Right? And she also had a, a very similar story for me. I believe she only got, she only gained a lot of weight when she started going low carb. Um, so that's a very having somebody empathize with your history is a very good way of convincing them that like maybe they're wrong right um, and it got to the point where when I started reading her stuff and Alan Aragon stuff and Lyle McDonald stuff there was more evidence to suggest that perhaps I uh, misinterpreted some things about my own data and so um, it, it came to the point where like if I were to still believe that carbs were the devil, I would have been a zealot, right? Because there's more evidence to suggest that I should switch my own beliefs. And that's that's what I did. That's, uh, yeah, I, I, I think I, I think there were a lot of people that took a similar path. I know I did. I did paleo. And I was like, carbs are evil. They're horrible. They're bad. And the thing that bugs me now is after I kind of got past that and realized that I fucking love Ben and Jerry's. Um, <laughs> And love carbs, and that I perform better with them, and that your brain was the work off of glucose, and that's what every doctor has ever said in any medical study. So shut up, whoever is on a blog. You're not a doctor. The thing that bugs me now is I see stuff where people are like, "Oh, there's there's so much more sugar nowadays in all of our food, and our our grandparents didn't eat this." And I'm like, "Bullshit! I don't think you've ever been to like a real Southern grandmother cooking. There are pies. There's fat back." There's sugar in everything. There's sweet tea. You know what our grandparents did? They weren't sitting on their asses. That's what they did. Wait, are, are you from the South? Go ahead. Oh, sorry, are you from the South? Yeah, I am uh, from oh, North Carolina. Oh, nice. I'm from, I'm from uh, well, I grew up most of my like adolescent life in New Orleans. So I, oh. I, 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 well, I identify with the South. Yeah, see, I've always – New Orleans is kind of different because it is the South, but it's not the South because Louisiana still has, like, a lot of French law. Like, it's a very different – Yeah. It's it's a very different South. Because um, even the whole – I don't think it's different South like Texas or Florida. Those when, – when people say, like, South is Texas or Florida, I'm like, I don't consider Orlando, like – No. No, I consider Orlando and North maybe part of the South. Orlando and South, not a part of, like, the southern United States. Uh, but, yeah, th I think that's what bugs me now is I see so many people say, oh, well, sugar is evil, and we have more sugar and stuff now than, than we did 50 years ago. And I'm like, no, no, we didn't. Like, I don't see that because that's not what I – I grew up around apple pies all the time and a pound of sugar in your tea and – my grandfather was like 75 years old and 155 pounds and could outwork an 18 year old. Like he just went and did stuff. He didn't sit inside all day. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. Um, so, you know what they also didn't do apparently? Or the early farmers, early people in agriculture, uh, they woke up at five. They didn't eat breakfast until like eight or nine. They started like plowing the fields. Yeah. That's a genuine plowing. My so my wife's four hours right without like eating anything. Yeah, it's, yeah. Um, my 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 father-in-law is a uh, he, a farmer and horseshoer in New Hampshire, and he's up at like four thirty, has coffee, goes out, does his morning chores, and doesn't come back and eat breakfast until like eight thirty or nine. Oh wow! 
that like and it's it's crazy that like a 65 year old man could, is way more shredded than some 25 year olds i've seen i'm like guys come on <laughs> um what's i gonna say you know what i've always been really interested in is um you look at people who can make these radical radical adjustments to, to their their very deeply seated beliefs right like change their right. self sense of self and i wonder what the commonality of their characteristics is right. Um, there's this this dude named his name is Antonio Valadares. He runs Evil Sugar Radio, and this dude used to be vegetarian. Well, he used to be like super super Christian because he's he's Cuban, and he used to be super vegetarian, and then he he went from that to super paleo, and now he's moderate, right? And yeah. you hear these stories because like. I just named the, the things that like people will rarely, rarely change. So I'm wondering what like the commonalities of people who do um, are able to, to dig into their own like personal beliefs and like question whether, uh, whether they're correct and then are courageous enough to change them. Like there must be a set of characteristics that like, like define them or that's different about them. That's, that's a, the type of stuff that I think about. Yeah, actually, no, that's, that's a good point. Cause I, there are, th- Cause I struggle with that too. Um, you know, I, I, I realize, I, I think one of the things that, that worked for me, uh, to help me kind of get over my arrogance, which my wife would laugh at right now. Cause I'm an egotistical douchebag. What can I say? Um, but I'm awesome. But, um, you know, like listening to philosophy and like listening to philosophers talk about like, you know, operating on less and, and realizing that, you know, nothing, um, and, and looking at things as like, okay, this is what I believe, but can I actually, is this logical? Does it work? Um, I think it's, if you have a more objective view, you know, and can, and can step out, it's a little easier. I think just most people just want to be told what to do. Like, I think that's really what it is. You know, no one ever questioned the food pyramid. No one ever questions this or that. I think we just kind of like being told what to do. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And that's, so that's what I meant in my article when I said, if you fail, you're lazy, right? It doesn't mean you're physically lazy, but it means you're lazy in some sense. You could be mentally lazy. You could be lazy about being introspective. Right. Um, but you're lazy in some sense. And people just like blew up over that because they didn't read the fucking article. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I fundamentally think that if you can't change the way that you think, given other information, then you're lazy in a way. I, and philosophy, dude, actually, uh, since you bring it up, that's one of the things that actually really, really tore down my, my stubbornness. I started following this dude. Um, I, I uh, joined one of his like group classes named Matt Perryman. Right? He wrote Squat Every Day. Um, yeah. And I got really into like epistemology. So before Matt Perryman, I thought science was like the fucking answer, right? Like if there was a PubMed study on something, then it was obviously true. Um, and then I realized that, like, scientists are just, like, they're fucking, like, high school girls arguing about, like, who's fucking, <laughs> like, the hot dude for prom, right? Like, you know, like, fucking, par- most people have this, this notion that college professors or researchers are completely objective. But what I've been told is, uh, the analogy is, like, look at how they fight over the fucking closing, the closest parking space to the research building, right? They're like catty little girls. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, you'll see this on the internet a lot. Um, somebody will post an article saying, hey, look, here's Siri Torino 2010. Saturated fat has been vilified. Um, because here's a meta-analysis of like hundreds of thousands of people who didn't develop heart disease or there's no real correlation when you got it. And then some vegetarian... Um, sick, like actually vegetarian, uh, will say, wait a minute, that study is like super flawed. Here's my study on veg- vegetables. And then like that'll just go back and forth. And like, what? I'm not blaming the vegetarians, although I do usually side with the people who like meat because let's be honest, meat is fucking delicious. And Yes, it is. <laughs> it is fucking delicious. Um, and I-, I can understand compassion reasons for not eating meat, but like other than that, like, really uh but but you know you get into this like back and forth where people are these sides are not going to listen to any fucking thing that the other side has to say right uh and then they're using science 
in order to justify the release, which I, is I think the worst thing that you can do, um, because that's using like the ultimate like kind of kind of good power um, for evil because of your own ego. Right, so I just don't need to get in those debates. If you want to be a fucking vegetarian, like go be a vegetarian. If you want to eat lots of meat, go eat lots of meat. I prefer to eat lots of meat, but if I have a client who says they're vegetarian, I'm like, okay, but I'm not going to change your beliefs. Believe that. Here are your macros. Shut up. Yeah. No, I I agree. I I think that what a lot of people don't realize about like studies done at a collegiate level is many times those professors are getting grants from like government agencies or other agencies to prove a certain point for them to get the money for that grant and the money for that grant pays for a lot of their tenure. So they have to have that grant money or they're not going to have a job because <laughs> the university is going to be like, well, you aren't bringing in anything. So get the fuck out. Absolutely. Um, and yeah. you're exactly right. right? Like, so it's just, you, you got to realize that someone's always trying to sell you something always. Except for me, I never try to sell anyone anything. You can always trust me. That's right. That's right. Listen to Dr. Dick Talons. All right, a couple, a couple of fun questions before we, uh, before we wind down the podcast. Um, so, I, so I, I got to ask real quick. What is your training regimen like now? Because you're so, I know you're busy and you're always writing. Do you still find time to get in the gym? Do you just do like one or two full body days? Yeah. So here's my philosophy right now. Um, I don't have the time to be as serious as I was before at some point, right. At some, like my eventual goal is to be 40 years old, walking around at like 10% body fat at a 190 to 200 pounds. Right. So if I can't accomplish that now, the best thing that I can do is keep slowly building mass and losing fat such that my, uh, let's say my settling point body fat wise is, is always constantly lower. Um, and you know, work out, as much as I, I possibly can in order to, to make sure that, you know, my, my lean mass is, is high enough. Uh, so I have a coach named Ben Tormey. Dude is fantastic. You should invite him on the show. He's really, really fucking good. Um, he's already been on the show. Oh, wait, he has? Yeah, Ben. ben he, I had to wake up at like 5 a.m. one morning to get him on the show. Why did Ben Tormey? All right, I'm closing my fucking <laughs> Because you you listed him as one of the top five people uh, in the fitness industry. I got all five in last year. <laughs> that's awesome, dude. Yeah, no, he's – oh, oh, good. that's good hustle, sir. That's Thank very, you. very good. I, I do have to say this. My wife heard his voice. My wife went, oh, damn. Ben is an interest. so Ben is actually um, – I think this is open, so I'm going to share it anyway because uh, I, I just think the world of Ben. When I met Ben, I thought he had the highest EQ out of anyone I'd ever met. Right, um, like the dude's emotional quotient, like emotional intelligence is through the roof. Then I found out when he was young, he was diagnosed with uh, autism. Right, wow. I don't know whether the diagnosis was true or not, but you know, usually people who are diagnosed with autism is like, you know, majority of like people you'll see working in like software. So, so you, it's like people who just like don't have very high EQs. You don't see a lot of them on photocracy. Ha, <laughs> J or Reddit, JK. Um, and they will just have no awareness of what the other person's thinking. Somehow Ben managed to, and he's the ultimate, like, ultimate fucking uh, proof that, you know, you can change no matter who you are, managed to take this diagnosis of autism, and, and he told me, like, he couldn't understand what other people are thinking, and take that and become one of the most like brilliant people I've ever seen when it comes to analyzing another human being. Right. So, I mean, that just goes to show like, if you really, really work at something, even if people tell you you can't do it, um, like they just don't fucking listen to them. Cause yeah, Ben is just like, like I have a lot of personal issues on my own when it comes to building habit and like, uh, building habit, working out, staying on a regimen like binge eating. And, and Ben, I swear to God, it more than any other coach has just like, killed all those for me um so to think he was actually diagnosed with like the same fucking uh, like he was on the autism spectrum is just like insane to think about okay um so what is your what is your, when you're in the gym working out with that regimen that ben gave you what is your guilty pleasure track that you would uh shamefully admit is on your workout mix no i don't i don't listen to music but i'm really weird 
don't listen to music. <laughs> ever listen to music. This is really strange. Uh, yeah. I guess cats out the bag. Yeah, I hate this. I hate when I'm like on a date and they ask me two things. One's like, what do you do for fun? On uh, the other's like, what do you think you listen to? Like, I don't do anything for fun except for like work and uh, write. <laughs> Uh, this this is changing by the way. This year is the year that I'm gonna start doing things for fun again. On um, the second is I don't listen to music. Really weird. Huh. Okay. Interesting. All right. If you could have dinner with one famous person from history, who would it be and why? Is Hitler an acceptable? <laughs> I love you. <laughs> Oh my God! Ah, oh, I feel like that's gonna have to go up on the uh, "I'm going to hell for this" subreddit. <laughs> no, I honestly, I'm very curious as to if I were to have dinner with one person in history. The one thing I'd want to know is what their persona is like, what their motivations were, like what type of person yeah. um, they are, and understanding like how somebody like Hitler became such a horrible human being. You know, Hitler was actually a huge um, dude like loved animals, right? Yeah. Um, he like fucking loved, like really, really, really loved animals. He was an animalitarian. I don't know what the fuck you call that, but like um, I guess meshing those two, I, I would be very interested in how to reconcile those two aspects of him. Like something that like could like really love creatures and really hate creatures, right? Like um, yeah, and so, I mean, as a point of interest and a point of learning, I think he'd be super, super, uh, interesting to, to just, like, read. Yeah, no, I, I, I kind of agree. Like, I, I, like, there's a part of me that, like, with the, the horror movies, like, when they redid Halloween, I'm like, I don't want to know why Mike Myers does what he does. I just want to be scared of Mike Myers, you know? Um, but... I feel like there are those kind of crazy psychos in history that I'm like, I kind of want to sit down to dinner with them. I want to know why they are. Yeah. It's, it's anyone who has like two, two viewpoints or two sides of them that, that you can't really automatically reconcile, I think. And for me, that ultimate person is Hitler. Like how do you become somebody who's just like comes from this background that you think would, would build a, character of empathy like he was poor he was an right. artist uh and then like do all these horrible things right um and that would just be like very i, I guess it'd be a, a learning um hey i'd learn a lot from from seeing somebody like that okay. other than that probably somebody i'd really want to bang like here nightly um, <laughs> fine or is this like i, th I think I think Did I'd have to go back for like 1977 uh, Carrie Fisher. I, think that's what I'd have to go for. <laughs> I don't know what 1977 Carrie Fisher looks like. Uh, have you never seen Star Wars? Oh wait, wait, Leia. Yes. <laughs> oh, I'm thinking of somebody else. I'm totally thinking of somebody else. I'm thinking of <laughs> chick who got got um the the skating chick. Oh no, no, the giant Star Wars nerd that I am. Not gonna lie. There was, you know, that the only Friends episode that I ever watched that I was like, okay, that has some truth to it, was the one where they were like, yes, every guy fantasizes of having sex with a woman in the Leia bikini. So, <laughs> you know, I have a horrible, horrible confession that you know I don't have much geek cred anyway. Uh, I actually watched Star Wars in order. I watched it literally almost in order. No, I watched one, two, four, five, six. Okay. And, uh, it's a very, very weird progression to see it in. Well, hey, at least you got through a Mike Vacanti can't get through Empire. <laughs> Wait, Mike was on this show. My fucking ex roommate was on this show. Like, uh, like yeah, because he was I, one of the five people taking the fitness industry by storm. <laughs> Plus, Mike, Mike, I, I did the sixteen weeks of sexiness cool. program last year, and Mike's remained fairly close with me. So, how how was that? It was good. Uh, I got down to nine and a half percent body fat and like was super shredded for my wedding. Yeah. Awesome. It should be good because Mike takes a lot of sort of lost face for me, you know what I'm saying? I uh, know <laughs> Mike is, is also somebody who just like manages to marry um, very high empathy with also being like bro and like tough love. 
Uh, yeah. Funny story of how Mike met me, actually. Uh, we were at a gay bar, and no, I'm just kidding. Uh, no, <laughs> dude, dude stalked me on Talk or see. Um, had this like rip picture, and he's like, "Hey, I heard you're coming to this like speaking event, and you're like speaking in this event. I really want to go to your like thing." And I was like, "Who is this dude?" Um, and uh, I was like, "Yeah, dude, like come to the event. Tickets are like kind of expensive, but yeah, you can you can come." And uh, I don't know what happened. He ended up not coming, and he was just like stalking me all the time at the soccer skate. Um, and I, I was like, okay, I'll meet, I'll meet up with you, dude. I, you know, it was his picture on photography. It was like, it didn't look like him. It looked like he was just like kind of creepy. I think he was like holding a dumbbell or something. He was like, uh, <laughs> and so I eventually met up with him and he was like, we clicked instantly. We were like boys ASAP. Um, and it's, it's cause he's not like an online nerd. He's not like me. Uh, yeah. so he's like the whole internet, you know, he, he's actually, Mike is actually cool. Unlike myself. Who just fake my course? I'm I'm really sad he's not going to be at the at the summit in May. So, wait, what? Oops. We're supposed to be together. Sorry, one sec. He actually <laughs> just literally pinged me now as you were talking. Well, because I I sent him an email and I'm gonna get so <laughs> Mike's gonna be like, uh, way to go, bro. <laughs> no, no, we're gonna we're gonna have all the viewers of the podcast. Mike, wait, you're not coming to the summit. I'm on a live podcast. We are supposed to room together. Please respond. <laughs> this is like dot, dot, dot typing. I'm not going. One sec. I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> you are dead to me. <laughs> dating side quests. Podcast live right now. <laughs> I might have an email here in a second. <laughs> <laughs> no, I emailed him and he was like, "Yeah, I'm not going." And that's why I was like, "Oh, well, crap." But uh, yeah, so uh, awesome. Well, Dick, thank you so much for coming on. If people do want to find you online and and follow you and le- and read more of your articles, where can they find you online? Don't fucking follow me. If if you find if you run across one of my articles, that's great. But like, yeah, you will probably be pissed at my trolls and you know, <laughs> funny guy like hating my guts. Not really. I'm serious because most people are kind of aspy anyway. Um, so really, really, just don't fucking follow me. If you want to, if you really want to, it's Dick Talons on Twitter. Uh, Dick like the penis and Talons kind of like the claw. But, um, but I re- I highly recommend you do not fucking follow me. <laughs> Unless you want to train with me, because I'm a really, really good trainer. Um, and that is truth. <laughs> yeah, other than that, don't follow. Oh, unless, and also if you're cute and chick. And, you know. Right, right, right. Of course, of course. Uh, well, Dick, thank you so much for coming on. It has been a blast, sir. Uh, and I look forward to getting super drunk with you in May. I, 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 honestly, I was on the fence, and like this kind of, we'll talk. We'll <laughs> cool. I'm, well, I'm well, six right now. <laughs> we'll go get some, go get some sleep and uh and and we'll talk later. All right, Broski. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye, bye. Now what is so damn funny? I could have swore you said me out. You look like a cat to you, boy. <laughs> Am I jumping around all nimbly bimbly from tree to tree? Uh, no, no. <laughs> Am I drinking milk from a saucer? <laughs> no. Well, do you see me eating mice? <laughs> hey, you stop laughing right now. Yes, sir. Now, I'm going to have to give you a ticket on this. But... No buts, meow. That's the law. Not so funny meow, is it? Meow.